What we're doing different today is we're doing nothing but top fives. As in, ah, you know, everybody, everybody else, everybody has a schmuck, a super fan likes doing the top five characters, the top five episodes, the top five this, whatever. Fuck all that. We're doing a different fucking spin on top fives here. Who has been watching versions of top fives applicable to the Sopranos today? All right. So the first top five I want to hit you with and I want to throw you away as far as let's see how you take it, you perceive it, is the top five either biggest rumors, what ifs, and or just points, tidbits to bring up about the show itself, which I found interesting. So first up would be number five, five, four, three, two, one. Number five would be Tony Soprano. Anthony Soprano is without a doubt the single toughest most badass man with a lisp to ever exist on TV and or life in general. There's no fucking with him. There's no picking on him. There's no trying to push back as far as, sir, I can't understand your lisp, which is going on real heavy. Now, I don't know what happened from season one through three versus season three through six because... The lisp just kind of snaps itself into existence from three to six. It's there, it's prominent, and I don't know why it happened. I don't know, maybe something happened to his teeth, um, mouth action, whatever the fuck too. I think I read somewhere online where supposedly he was dealing with a speech coach who may have suggested he started adopting the lisp to add to Tony because the character was so flawed but people loved him still so much maybe it was something to deter them from loving him or forgiving him for all his sins because Tony's no fucking saint or a saint of Newark thank God because well you know the movie was terrible but he's far from a good guy he's just the main guy the main attraction but he's like the lovable bad guy like in wrestling a very good bad guy is the guy you love the fucking boo the guy you love to hate, but you're there to watch what he does next. That's Tony Soprano for you. Kills without a second thought. Gives the order to kill. Makes money moves. You know, fucks all the bitches. Gets all the fucking kind of dumb mob boss luck you can only beg for and imagine. And he's still on his own fucking two. Relying on himself at the end of the day if, if need be. But he does have the split assigned between family family and the crime family. But maybe, maybe that was something thrown in to be like, you know what? Maybe he is a little too charming. Maybe he is a little too lovable. As deeply flawed, as, you know, evil as Tony can be when he wants to be like that. He'll just, you know, defend it by saying, oh, well, you know, a boss has got to do what a boss has got to do. But still, you know, there's some shit that's unforgivable. But, uh... I want to think the lisp might have been thrown in there just to throw people off from loving him so much. But it is done pretty badly because the lisp does gradually evolve to the point in season six. It's just fucking there the whole time. You know, God forbid he hits any words with S's or C's or even S sounds in it. And it's just fucking there. I ain't from Soprano. He sounds like he's half spangered with how heavy the lisp action and prominent it is throughout the whole time. It's like trying to pick up radio static, police chatter through his fucking teeth or whatever. And as soon as he hits a fucking S on anything, it's just... I'm trying to fucking intercept alien uh, chit-chat through a tinfoil hat. But then the best or all I can get is... Scatter. Or, uh, you know, a TV... Uh, snow shit or radio fucking in between the, 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 the old staticky sounds you used to pick up when you were trying to change stations while driving but then it flips automatically to AM because you're like out of state like, whatever it was just, it just bothered me a lot that was the only thing I had against James Gandolfini rest in peace of course first and foremost besides that great actor great character no fighting that but without a doubt the toughest guy to lisp ever on TV that you do not want to fuck with ever. Number four of the top five biggest rumors, what ifs, slash points to bring up on the show, or fun facts, is that Jerry Stiller, also rest in peace to him, 
was supposed to be originally casted as Hesh, the Jewish connect, the Jewish consultant money man that even Tony starts to have problems with despite the fact that he was good with his dad. He's been good with Tony since forever and all that shit too, but when money's involved, you know, hey, you never, you, you start to see your friends' true colors per se, and that's Hesh. Now, my problem with Hesh, the character, or at least the actor portraying him the whole time in the series, was that Hesh spoke so fast and choppy Anytime he was on screen, like 95% of the time, I was thanking God I was smart enough to put on closed captioning to watch the fucking show again because I would have missed everything this man ever said. It was too rushed and fast and choppy. It was like, uh, what's that guy's name? Uh, Jackie, not Jackie Cooper, Jackie, uh, I forget the name, but it was like a, it was like a TV show host, a, a comedian or whatever, uh, Jewish, of course. But he spoke so fucking fast too. It was funny the way he spoke, it was like, uh, 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 like, it, like despaired all the fucking time in a rush to fucking uh, go to the bathroom because his diarrhea was starting to act up like that. Hesh gave me those vibes, but had it been Jerry Stiller playing Hesh, I think it would have been too much of a joke. I love Jerry Stiller. I loved him as Frank Sansa on Seinfeld, and I loved him obviously as Arthur Spooner on The King of Queens and just about anything he's ever done. But, and again, rest in peace. I think he might have been too funny to seriously portray Hesh the way the Hesh we got did. So, I think it would have been hard for the crew, the cast, to keep like a, a straight face with him around because he was legit that funny. And from what I understood and read, while he was still with us, rest in peace again, he was a great guy and a legit nice guy. So it would have been hard to work around someone always that funny and maybe he would have felt the urge to always be funny like that, crack a joke, say something loud with like Frankenstein's or Arthur Spooner energy too and then imagine, you know, Serenity Now would have applied to Tony beautifully throughout the fucking series with all the shit he's going through. Serenity Now! Or whatever. Or Serenity Now! As Tony would say with the lisps, of course. But Jerry Stiller makes me reconsider the fact that he could have been great, potentially, if Hesh was a funny comedic role, but it never really was. So, yeah, nah, it wouldn't have worked. But it was interesting to fucking find that out, though, that he was offered the role, I believe, but for whatever reason, he turned it down. So, we'll never know why, or unless I do more research, but either way, interesting tidbit to think of. Number three on this list, Alec Baldwin. Always ready to prove himself as an entitled fat face cunt and or better yet said an attention whore who was okay on Dirty Rock, I'll admit to, otherwise I can't stand the man, was such a fan of The Sopranos that he either made a call, I believe, to either David Chase or someone very high up as far as casting is concerned, just to be like, you know what, I'm such a big fan and I'd be such a gift for the show, I need to be cast as the guy that kills Tony Soprano and also runs off with fucking Mella, Carmella, eventually to give her her happily ever after that she so rightfully deserves because of putting up with all the Tony shit. I love the response he got according to his own story that he openly admitted to as far as the response he got when he proposed that and said, great, I'll add you onto the list of Irish actors that are demanding to be on the show too as well. Maybe I'll put you at the top of it, but you know, We'll call you, don't call us. Basically, shut the fuck up. It makes no sense. Even though a Baldwin did make it on as far as Danny Baldwin's concerned, which makes you think, maybe Alec is telling the truth about that story, but he was so petty about not getting casted, he said, all right, unless you want me to fucking call in some people and get the show uh, canceled or, you know, give it the axe, whatever. You know, you better put my brother in there. And then they, they got to fucking scramble to ask him, well, which one, asshole? You got so many. It's like, oh, you know, this one's committed to this fucking B-movie. This one's doing this piece of shit. Who gives a fuck whatever project? Uh, Danny's free. Throw him in there for fucking that pretend movie you're doing. Just make it work. Just make it work, whatever. And then, of course, he was the mob boss in that movie that Chris uh, what wrote, produced, and got financed by Little Carmine, uh, Cleaver. And he did his thing, which I'll admit... Even though that's a pretend movie in a non-existent from real life series, it kind of worked. It, it wasn't bad. 
he plays a really convincing dying man who gets hacked to death, if anything, too. And he played himself in the fucking show, so enough credit due there. Funny enough, I think Cleaver, at that time at least, you know, the logic was right there, though. You know, a hostile saw all those one day movies. Cleaver could have worked potentially, at least in the horror genre, because as time progressed, the horror, you know, thriller movie genres only evolved since then. As far as people trying to get more dramatic and more drastic with what they do in the horror movies and shit, too. I think it could have worked as a B film. Cleaver, a mob boss, has his main guy whacked to sleep with his fucking wife, fiance, girlfriend, whatever. The guy isn't properly disposed of, enough at least, where his body parts come together, he's got a cleaver for a hand, and he's out for revenge on his fucking boss. Not a bad premise, actually, I'll admit. On to number two, on the top five list of biggest rumors, what ifs, and or fun facts, things to point out from the series. Number two is, Chaz Palm and Terry could have been Tony Soprano at some point eventually, early in its development. Now... I'll admit openly, I am a fan, a big fan of Chaz Palminteri. I wouldn't say mostly due to a Bronx Tale, but in strong part due to a Bronx Tale. I love that movie. I did a review of it not too long ago. It's here on my IGTVs, and soon enough I'll get to it eventually to put it up on YouTube as well. I love that movie for the acting, the story told, Robert De Niro's directorial debut in one of two movies that he's only directed. And Chaz Palminteri is awesome as uh, Sonny. I love the backstory to it as far as this being roughly based on his own story coming up in Yonkers. And the fact that even more endearing to me, at least as a creative, the fact that he was damn near 40, where he said, finally, you know what? Fuck all this other shit. I'm sitting down. I'm writing this fucking story. I'm making it happen some way, somehow. I'm committing to it blindly gets a one-man show to fucking tell his story it starts fucking growing word gets around as far as the show's concerned its popularity starts to peak and shit he's got to move on to bigger and more open venues to fucking do the one-man show he's got celebrities coming through like a-listers like burt reynolds Sylvester stallone and eventually robert de niro who came in and was so enthralled by the one-man show and so you know what let's bring this to the big screen I'll trust you to be the brain power behind making this shit possible and the rest is history. And ever since then, he's been more than fine. He's done plenty of other roles too and proven himself to be a great fucking actor and overall just cool as shit. I love Chaz Palminteri. Long story less long, <laughs> Betty had said. I did think about it though, actually, and there's no denying James Gandolfini does way too good a job to really express the many layers, the depthness, the flawed nature of one Tony Soprano, where I don't think anybody else could have done it justice. <laughs> and I mostly view Chaz Palminteri as just that really smart, cool guy that just, I don't know if he would have been able to get as deep as James Gandolfini, rest in peace, did with Tony Soprano. I think it would have been great but I think we would have gotten more of the textbook mob boss tough guy where we only see the outside surface of what's the outer workings of, in this case, Tony Soprano. And the show would have been good in that sense, but it only would have ran maybe for like two, three seasons if we're lucky, kind of thing like that. With James, you get the cool fucking who don't want to be Tony Soprano, the alpha male leader of a fucking northern New Jersey crime family. But on the inside, and as we've seen flashbacks of him growing up with Johnny Boy, with his mom living, all that shit too, is so flawed and so fucked up that the cool exterior is just a mask, literally, to cover up his many faults as far as how screwed up on the inside he is, how miserable he is, depressed he is on the inside too, but he's still able to function as a boss. Of all things, a crime family like that and or waste management, as he likes to put it. Chaz would have been great if it was just a movie and or maybe two, three seasons long, I think. Deppness, I don't know if that's really up his avenue, but that's not to say he's not a good actor. I'm just saying 
his strong point would have been if Tony was more just like a superficial character like that. We don't get to know him as we do in depth for six seasons. Chaz, however, would have been great as another boss, as a rival boss, or a boss that kind of is chummy chummy with fucking Tony. I forget if it was because of his um, his throat issues, I believe it was cancer, that led him not to do the role, or I think he said on his podcast, the Chaz Palminteri Show, by the way, excellent podcast, um, if it was due to him not believing he'd do the role justice, but all in all, it really worked to not only James Gandolfini's favor, but also fans of the series' favor, too, because I think we just got the perfect Tony with James, so rest in peace to him again. Chaz Palminteri almost got him, almost got him as Tony, but you know, God bless him, great actor, talented director, all that shit too, but good thing we didn't get him. I don't think he maybe would have pulled it off like 100% like James did. Number one rumor I gotta get to as far as rumors, what ifs, and or tidbits from the show would be the show almost got canceled in season one. Episode 5, because David Chase, the creator of the show, and everybody else too, wanted to write in and shoot and show on that episode, episode 5, I believe, College, from season 1, that Tony has no shame and makes nothing of making work out of some poor fucking rat, aka they wanted to show Tony killing somebody with his own bare hands, which he did. But only after HBO said, you know what, god damn it, you can't do that with the lead character because that's already given Italian-Americans a bad stereotype as is. They're giving us pushback because of how we're portraying Italian-Americans allegedly too. If we show them killing somebody in cold blood, they're going to have our ass. And we, we have no fucking show after that too. So it wasn't until they rewrote the fact that the guy he does kill, uh, he strangles, excuse me, to death with his bare hands. They portray the guy he kills as a drug dealer and or giving drug to the youth. Only then can they justify, oh, you know what? As HBO, HBO says, you know what? In that case, if he's a scumbag, okay, let him kill him. That's fine, too. And it's a great episode, too. Uh, episode 5, college from season 1. So he is able to kill the guy with his fucking bare hands via a cord of some sort he got a hold of. Turns blue, purple, red, all the fucking colors in the rainbow as far as like no air to your throat permits you. Guy's dead. Tony's a victor. Got rid of one more rat. And one of the many cases of fucking like stroke of dumb luck that he just gets throughout the whole fucking series. Because this man never seems to get in any trouble. Like everybody dies around him. Everybody drops dead. It gets knocked off around him except for him. And then... He's panicking, he's having anxiety attacks about how to fucking deal with it, and just magically, shit just happens in his favor. Then he's able to move on with his fucking life. Uh, what was I going to say? What was I going to say? Also, also, about this episode, which really made it clear for me too, on YouTube, I strongly recommend you search the following. It's called The Sopranos, the episode that changed television forever. I forget the name of who made it, but it, it explains this episode so beautifully and goes so in-depth. As far as the symbolism, the um, hidden messages in it too, as far as like him killing the guy and him finally kind of bonding with Meadow as she's grown up into an adult w young woman, how the bond slowly breaks because of this one fucking action he takes upon himself, you know, to get his own literally hands dirty and shit. I recommend that video strongly. Shout out to whoever made that video. It's a fucking great deep dive into Sopranos, which every episode basically deserves its own deep dive like that. But yeah, that's the first top five we're getting to today. Now, the second top five, maybe you could say maybe we're going from good to bad, the bad to good, vice versa, back and forth, ping pong and all this shit too. The second top five list I got for you today, honoring the Sopranos, top fives and all that shit and more, brought to you by me, Who This, host of Who This Been Watching, youtube.com backslash who this is one, and or Who This Been Watching, the podcast on all podcasts and platforms of your preference and or choice. The second list, the top five worst bodies on the fucking show. Listen, Reddit, wherever else you can fucking look as far as forums and or message boards and or whatever's concerned, a big complaint, surprisingly from the male viewers, is that does anyone have a membership to the gym on this whole fucking show? Because goddamn, we got some sloppy bodies on here. 
Now, there are some great bodies of work, wink wink, as far as some of the cast is concerned. Believe me, there's plenty of evidence of that. We'll get to that in a little bit too. But again, like I said, the good with the bad, balance it out, whatever. Like we're Libra scales, kind of. But now we're going to get to the top five worst bodies. Believe me, there's a lot. But I had to narrow it down to five. Number five in this case would be easily Tony Soprano himself. Starts off the seasons uh, one, two, and three, I want to say. What's the best way I could put it as? Tony starts off as husky, I want to say. Not too chubby in the face. Yeah, a little bit of double chin action. A little bit. Hints of it. Primarily, he's got a little bit of a gut. It's not yet a belly. It's just a gut. It's prominent. It's there. You can tell he used to be an athlete. But, of course, clearly he never had to make it as a varsity athlete, according to Uncle Junior. But he used to know his way around some balls. And putting them in hoops and nets, goal posts, paws, etc. Of course. But he knew his way around some balls. He was athletic in his youth and his prime. Or his cash, better yet said. That's Tony. But then from season three onwards, as you can tell, half the time, most of the time, he's in a robe, in the uh, tank top shirt. He starts developing titties. The gut develops and turns into a belly. And you start to see him. He can't hide it anymore, at least. Not like he did in season one and two. The double chin is there with a vengeance to stay prominent front and center center stage with a fucking spotlight beaming on it I don't know what happened maybe he just gained weight to commit to the role further but he visibly got very sloppy Tony of course is funny like that because he'll point out everybody else that's balding and or bald a la Artie and also anybody else who's fat because he is too but he's the boss don't you ever dare say he's fat a la when he picks on Bobby half the time but yeah, it is pretty funny, and yeah, he's pretty sloppy towards the end of the fucking show as far as body type is concerned. I'm not here to body shame, but let's be real too. Then again, he is the boss. Who's going to fucking say a thing to him about his fucking body? Like, hey, you know, you know, cut back on the cannolis, maybe, you know, maybe not so much gabagool when you got your downtime going, boss. You know, skip because you're looking kind of schlubby out here. Like, what the fuck you shaming me? Whatever. That's number five. Number four on the top five worst bodies on The Sopranos has to go to, da, 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 no surprise, Janice, his sister. Basically, Tony Soprano with a wig on and a very bad perm wig on to boot. She's very sloppy, disheveled, female Tony Soprano energy prominent. The only thing saving her and to her merits is, I guess, a decent set of tits. But even that being said, the funniest thing in life or one of the oddest things I've encountered, irony, Betty had said, is a fat woman with no tits or very beasting little titties. Seems odd. Everything on you is already big enough. You know, take a look at your ass, take a look at your triple chin, take a look at your arm flab, whatever, too. But then to boot, or God's a prankster like that, you've got no titties. Clearly not Janice's case because she's got the tits to fucking show and be prominent with uses her to her advantage because obviously she's with uh what's his face uh ralphie uh before him there's richie they're all into her but i guess then again you know richie i understand because he just got out of prison for however long he was so and he used to have a little thing with fucking janice before he got locked up but after being away for so long and probably you know beaten off till he got bored with it or you know like they do in jail shout out to everybody locked up of course I'm not making fun of you guys at all whatsoever but as far as uh, prison's concerned I think they got the fee-fees like the jail made pussies whatever that they fuck like a like a towel they heat up in the microwave it, they warm it up so much and mold it up so much to make it feel like an actual pussy hey you're in prison you're in jail for that long I can't blame you I won't knock you for doing so make ends meet like that but once he transitions from jail to real life and then, oh shit, this old fling, this old fucking sack of potatoes, big titty bitch I used to fuck, still available? Let me see if I can get some of that. Committed to it, they got married, bought the big house, of course. He beats her up. She can't, she can't take that shit and does, I guess, the right thing and fucking shoots him dead. Then there's fucking Ralphie, who Ralphie was a whole fucking mess too. Hilarious, but... He's into fucking Janet, uh, Janet's, excuse me, but then he's also into fucking getting uh, thumbs, vibrators, anal beads up his ass, so he's a freaky boy, uh, mother complex, 
you know, 10 times worse than Tony ever had. Um, but yeah, on top of that, the titties are blemished with a very poorly done in taste, uh, what is it, the Rolling Stones logo, the teeth and the tongue fucking tattoo on the titty, which is always there, she can't hide it, even around children, whatever, it's just fucking right there in your face, like staring back at you. Janice is again Tony Soprano with a wig on, so definitely fourth worst body, a little worse than Tony because as a female she looks like Tony, but again with a very bad uh, labradoodle fucking wig on her head, slapped on there, whatever. Number three, as far as the top five worst bodies on the Sopranos, would go to oh hello Janice, meet your husband Bobby, Bobby Bacala. Now when we first get introduced to Bobby, he is very low ranking. He is Uncle Junior's driver and like living homemade assistant whatever the fuck the thing you first see on Bobby is not his big salchich nose or his jet black head of hair or his forever fucking tan bronze whatever he's got going on no the first thing you see on Bobby early on at least is that fucking immense belly gut pouch gooch whatever he's got going on it's just there front and center like you remember that old joke they used to make about J-Lo like, uh, she, anywhere she arrives, she walks in first, and then five minutes later, her ass follows up. It's the other way around with him. You first see this fucking big pot belly coming through, five minutes later, oh yeah, it's Bobby. Like, I didn't know that already by that violently explosive, ready to pop gut he's got on him. He did, in real life, of course, duh, lose weight, noticeable in his face, slimmed down, his old frame slimmed down too, and his fucking gut was gone. He was still pretty fat, so you can only imagine what's going on underneath his shirt after the fact, because uh, stomach stapling, liposuction after a certain age does wonders for your fucking physical form, but then there's the issue that's nagging and hanging, Betty had said, with the loose skin afterwards. So imagine, you know, two sloppily bodied individuals like Janice and Bobby getting it on and making a very cute daughter on top of that too. Even I think they know one and done was fine. Let's not ever try to do this again or make the sexy time to make a child like that. But Bobby did look better, but he was disgusting at first and got better, you know, after the fucking noticeable weight loss. But still, it was kind of like, imagine the horrors of him shirtless or on the fucking beach tanning, whatever. But that's Bobby, of course. Now, moving on to number two on the fucking top five worst bodies on The Sopranos. Number two, that honor, that badge of honor goes to fat-faced Vito. Or, you know, also, same thing as Bobby. He went through his fucking body transformation, went from a fat bitch to a bad bitch, but then that bad bitch had a fucking limp or was so fat before that it just deformed him bone structure-wise where he couldn't help but walk with a limp. He was literally a fucking overtanned or stuck in the microwave too long meatball. That's how I can best describe his shape and or form before he had the weight loss. Noticeable, of course, too, but he stayed fat because he was that fat to begin with. Even though he lost a lot of weight, noticeably, he stayed fat afterwards. But again, chubby, titties, pouch, Loose skin all over the fucking place, whichever way you looked on him too, he was just a mess. So he looked like a muffin that was slowly deflating, if anything. A lot of fucking muffin top, and just not a sight for anyone's eyes. And to boot, he was gay, which there's nothing wrong with that at all. But how poor Johnny Cakes, the guy from the diner he falls in love with after he ditches his wife and children pretty much, uh, how Johnny Cakes was ever to fucking manhandle, no pun intended, all of that shit, I don't know, but he tried his best, you know, and on top of that, imagine that guy, imagine that guy who has the hardest time in the world, owning up to the fact that he was so fat, he had to get fucking whatever surgery he had to lose all that weight, and had to deal with coming out the closet as a mob guy, he didn't want to own up to it, and you know, wants to beat him up in a fucking park a lot because he's calling him, you know, the F word referring to gay terminology and such for kissing him, even though he openly waited for him with an open mouth to be kissed by Johnny Cakes. 
they kiss and then he gets mad like hey man I'm not gay you are you made me do this and shit very confused character Vito very endearing towards the end I'll be honest though with the whole being a made man being gay having to live with that having to deal with leaving behind his wife and children because he was gay the whole time and internal conflict on a hundred guaranteed no judgment in that but a very sloppy physical form no question there even after the weight loss he was not a good looking man well maybe in the face you know not bad but body wise keep that clothed at all time you know whatever number one on the list however who takes the cake literally eats it all by themselves and leaves not one crumb even for the sake of evidence you know because everybody's involved in the mob here whether they like it or not is Ginny is it Guinea? no well excuse me <laughs> Genie Genie sorry I meant to say Genie I swear to God I meant to say Genie Genie aka Johnny Sack's wife holy shit she's sloppy very nice loving endearing sweet lady you know genuinely but the main reason why Johnny Sachs hates Ralph so much is at the expense of Ralph making that joke about Jeannie's fat ass about her having a fucking 95 pound mole removed from said humongously fat ass she's shaped like a fucking mole a mole you get on your fucking face the beauty mark sort of the ones you try to like pinch off and you know flick off if you get it off successfully or not you have to go to the dermatologist to have them fucking like burn it off or twist it off or whatever they used to do back when off She's shaped like that. She's shaped like a fucking chocolate chip. She's shaped like a fucking a mole. She's shaped like the cupcakes, the fucking Reese's cups, the shit she sneaks away to the basement and eats when Johnny's not there. But meanwhile, Johnny's the one acting holier than now and actually being a good guy enough, you know, despite the fact he's giving orders to have people killed and such. At least he's courteous enough to love his wife genuinely and tell her on numerous occasions. I love you how you are. If not, I would not have married you. Or I'd have a guma. I'd have a side piece. I'd have all these women on the side considering I'm a boss. I have power. I have authority. I can make it happen. But I don't because I love you, bitch. You fat ass. She still chooses to fucking eat her own body weight and sweets and, and, and you know, whatever she's not supposed to be having. She's supposed to be on, what is it, uh, Jenny Craig or Weight Watchers, whatever, too. What are you doing, Weight Watch? Do you just watch your weight in that case and watch it go up as you fucking continue to eat? Because she is, like, uncontrollably fat. There's no way to hug this bitch. It's like trying to hug a fat bitch. Wide wingspan action. You know, that's good for fucking when you're in the gym. Imagine hugging a fat bitch. But then when you're trying to literally, you know, really actually hug a fat bitch, it makes it very, you know, tense on your fucking, um, what do you call it, rotator cuffs. So... Ginny takes the fucking cake as far as the top five worst bodies on The Sopranos. Now, the next top five we've got to get to. You know, the good and the bad, we're kind of trading off here a little bit too, like the little angel on one arm, the little devil on the other. Now we go to the good. From bad bodies to b -b 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 baddies. The top five baddies, quote unquote, from The Sopranos in itself. Now listen, I, I know I've said bitch a bunch of times already on this episode, pet episodes, whatever too. I'm only human, and I'm not doing it to demean anybody, but that's just the way I'm referring to somebody in the sense of a show, a movie, whatever the fucking case is. Baddies is not meant to be taken with disrespect. It's acknowledging the beauty of the following five women I will be alluding to and or simping over. Number five for me is a personal favorite from the first time I laid eyes on her in Goodfellas anything else she's done up until the sopranos and even after the sopranos because she is aging like fine wine god damn it i'll die on that hill if i have to but even now and still she's looking mighty fine and she could prescribe me with the love antidote at any given time hopefully to cure me of what i got which is a sickness <laughs> i'm fiending for her still number five is dr melfi aka lorraine brocco she plays throughout season one through six, the fucking therapist for Tony Soprano, the one that prescribes him the medicine so he can stop fucking having anxiety attacks and or passing out. In general, as he's alluded to many times as he's tried to forcibly make happen, she is a bad one. 
sly. Chef's kiss to her. Especially, I mean, she's been good looking since fucking Goodfellas, Lorraine Bracco. Here, too, she is refined, mature, and wears the shit out of all these pantsuits, businesswoman suits, whatever you want to call them things. But she got the legs on display. She's got the fucking hourglass frame figure on display, too. It's a beautiful fucking ordeal. It's like that. That fantasy I'm sure we all have. Like if we ever have to go to therapy, we ever have to deal with our mental health like that, let it at least be with something as beautiful as her just so it, we can be at more ease discussing that with her openly. So, you know, besides the fact her thinking most likely we're fucked up on deep on the inside, at least we can imagine they find us endearing enough where we can have an affair with a fucking beautiful therapist. That's number five, not the Melfi. Number four are the top five baddies of the Sopranos. Number four, that honor goes to Meadow Soprano. Now, is that an easy choice? Maybe, but still. I've always liked Jamie Lynn Sigler. Same thing from the moment I laid eyes on her. Now, I didn't watch The Sopranos when it was first on back in 1999, so at that time, she was, I believe, underage. If I'm not doing the math wrong, I hope. Um... She grew up to be of legal age on the show. I don't remember, to be honest, I think. But um, hopefully I'm not out of bounds. But basically, from season three onwards, when all of a sudden, like, her body, whoop, boom, kicked in the fucking full gear. Holy shit. That's a meadow I'd love to be perched upon, sitting on a log, looking over, finally. And just begging for this sunset to never end so I could just stay there forever. In full view of this beautiful meadow. My God, what a lovely young woman she grew up in the being. Uh, lovely face. Reminds me somewhat sort of Marissa Tomei vibes as far as how pretty and still great looking she is now. If you've seen her recently, she was, um, if not last week, like two weeks ago on Talking Sopranos, that podcast as well too. Shouts again to... Talking Sopranos, Michael Imperioli, and Steve Sherpa. But yeah, she was there. Still looks fucking great. She was actually married for a little bit. She broke my heart doing that. But then she got divorced. I don't know if she's married again since. But I know she had a child or children since. So, you know, there's that too. Meadow has grown to be a lovely young lady. My God. Uh, grew up into a whole badass fucking woman. Like she ended up being, even at the end of season six, just... Beautiful, lovely, smart, charming, like just a work of art. Living and breathing in the flesh. I love to be in that flesh. Number three on the top five baddies on The Soprano. The baddest women. Bad meaning good and oh my God, they got the goods to look at as far as I can is concerned. Number three. Dead in the middle with this one. I would have put her higher, but then that would have been maybe... I don't know, too easy of a choice. And this is, of course, my top five. So I'm not saying everybody has to agree with me, but I'm saying according to me, and hopefully to bring up discussion amongst yourselves, you, yourself, whatever, this is my number three. And it was hard, believe me, it was hard, by looking at her as often as I did on the fucking show and having to place her at number three. But number three goes to Adriana, a.k.a. in real life, Drea and Mateo. Woo, boy, talk about bodies. I'd easily give the best overall almost damn near flawless body honor to Adriana, Drayda Mateo, the whole time from when she shows up on the fucking series towards the end when she, thank God, gets killed off screen, apparently because she was so beloved by the audience and they didn't want to like demean a woman or something like that too. When they killed her off, they had Silvio chasing her on hands and knees in the fucking forest or woods, wherever he took her to, to fucking shoot her in the head, you know, as we can only assume, shoot a dead. But again, off screen so we don't have to literally see her brains flying out of head or fucking eyes popping out whatsoever, none. What a piece of ass. No disrespect in that being said, but what a piece of ass. What a woman the whole time. The outfits always skin tight, belly showing, belly ring in full effect, tight on the fucking ass, perking up the tits. The hair is undoubtedly fucking Jersey nor than I guess as they fucking presumed the whole time as the show existed but even you can even overlook that you can only imagine she smells like a fucking cigarette the whole time but you think in the back of your mind she's so goddamn fine I could 
plug my nose if worse comes to worse. And then you think about fucking Chris or Michael Imperioli, you know, whatever on the show. He's got such a fucking schnoz on him, as Tony likes to point out a lot. He's got such a fucking beak, a fucking toucan sand on him. He must have been putting up with the cigarette smell the whole time. But then again, he was smoking like a fiend also, so it probably just canceled out, even with as big as nose as he had. But again, Adriana so goddamn fine to boot. Malone, LeBlanc, Louis Vuitton, whatever she fucking chose at that time too. To boot. That could be overlooked. It's like having a, a, a baddie in real life that smokes like a fucking chimney. You can overlook it for so long or you can play, you know, dumb with your nose. Hopefully you got a small one. Like I got a smaller one, obviously, than Chris did. But you know what I'm saying. Piece of ass the whole time. The FBI, everybody who's ever laid eyes on her can only admire her fucking body. I, I forget what season, what episode, but when Carmela takes her to fucking get tennis tr lessons or training, whatever, and I think the female trainer is so turned on by her that I, she either makes her a lesbian or if she was a lesbian already, she's like, oh man, I found some prime meat right here in this Adriana girl. Even the FBI agent spying on them the whole time can't help but be like schoolboys lusting for the fucking hot substitute when they keep laying eyes purposely on Adriana. And I bet amongst them they were fighting each other to see who's going to be assigned to fucking do surveillance for Adriana. No, 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 me, me. I, you did it last week. All last week. It's my turn this week. No, fuck face. You did it last week. What are you talking about? You were too boned up, bricked up to fucking even know the difference. No blood going to your brain. How would you fucking know? Fuck you. I got a wife at home. How dare you think I'm a fucking fiend like that? Et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, that's number three. Number two has got to go to someone who was only on the show, I believe, maybe two or three episodes at most. But regardless, nonetheless, piece of ass. What a woman. Oh my God, what a fucking woman. That honor goes to Annalisa, the female, the lady, my boss, from Italy. You know, that's where Tony goes. I believe it was with Paulie and Chris. They go over there to fucking bring over F uh, Furio. Uh, Shouts to him. I forget his real name in real life, the actor, but he was really good throughout the whole time. They bring over Furio in exchange for some business as far as, you know, uh, importing some cars over to Italy and shit, the motherland. She's a piece of ass. What a woman. What a refined woman, too. And makes you think. There's definitely been some lady mob bosses at some point in time in the mob itself, be it here, Italy, wherever. But goddamn, could could you possibly work under a woman that fine, that beautiful, that statuesque as Annalisa was, or in real life better yet known as Sofia Milos? Holy shit, I don't think I could. I'd be walking, <laughs> excuse me. First off, I'm not doing that in front of a fucking pretty ass lady like that, ever. I'm dressed to the fucking nines all the time, but then I make sure my thing isn't skin tight or super tight. It's like loose, forgiving enough where I don't look sloppy or like a schlub because I'm going to be bricked up the whole time just looking at her. Front and back, face only, trench coat, whatever she's got fucking on at that time it's gonna be too hard literally for me to deal with her or to work directly under her i'd have to fucking quit at some point in time shout out to wicked.crystal.shop for joining the live as well it'd be too difficult way too much of a fucking ordeal to deal with on a daily working for a fine fucking woman like her like that and to have her looking at you for too long in the eyes and shit and you're trying to not to break eye contact to like sneak a peek at her tits or hoping she turns around fast enough so you can just glance at the ass the whole time and then fucking make it back in time with her eyesight when she turns around to be like, ah, you listen to me and what? Like, yes, I heard you. Loud and clear. And just begging in the back of your mind, just turn the fuck around, turn the fuck around. Shut the fuck up and turn the fuck around again. Come on, let me follow you. Let me tell you, for real. That's number two on the list. Number one on the top five baddies on The Soprano. Bad ass women. Who boy, talk about bad ass. Number one, that honor has to go to someone who was on the show, but wasn't on the show. Of course, the show itself doesn't exist. It's not real life. It's make-believe characters. But talk about some of the genius of the fucking show itself. Make-believe, within the make-believe program itself, number one goes to Isabella. Or, better yet said in person in real life, I can't believe a woman this beautiful actually exists in real life in the physical form. 
Maria Grazia Scucinota. I hope I'm saying that right because she's like an angel, like an olive skinned angel. Maria Grazia Cucinota. I, I hope I said that right, but just Google that if you don't fucking believe me. Cucinota spelled C U C I N O T T A. Maria Grazia. What a woman. She's been in a bunch of shit since. I think the Sopranos only helped her to her favor. I mean, listen. I don't think she was going to have a hard time trying to get acting roles or landing gigs, at least as the fucking non-speaking, just beautiful woman standing in the background, in the forefront, wherever. But The Sopranos only helped her because it shows what a woman and what a fucking pleasant sounding woman on top of that too, to boot of all things. So to have her as just the imaginary figure that exists in Tony's mind as far as who we'd like to envision being with ideally ideal woman she moved next door she was like the um what do you call those foreign exchange students for her uh his neighbor that lived next door starting to become a doctor he's having dreams and fantasies about um her coddling him or breastfeeding him as well too something like that I forget but how the dream went but basically just existing in his own mind he was trying to ask people around specifically Carmela if he happened to, if she happened to notice the neighbor next door too and then on top of that as Carmela would and should and usually does never fail gets mad gets upset gets jealous about the fact that he's fantasizing about a whole other woman while he's got a whole lot of women in Carmela too chef's kiss I get it but then I don't get it but then of course such a fine woman like that who wouldn't get fucking jealous and or mad? So Isabella gets the number one on the top five bags, even though she doesn't technically exist. But she was on the show, and she was a female presence, a heavy female presence on the fucking show. Believe me. There was no shortage of fucking finance women on this show in itself to narrow it down to five. And believe me, I had a plenty hard time doing so. But this is, of course, my top five according to that. Like I said, good, bad, good, bad, trading off, fair deal, I hope. But now we move on to a not so pleasant category, but one that needs to be discussed if we're going to be actual adult fans of this program, this series, this epic. One of the most epic things that happened to television, The Sopranos. If we're going to be honest about it, we cannot sweep this under the rug, God damn it! But the top five biggest cunts on the whole show. What do I mean by cunts? I'm not talking about women anymore. Cunts in general term, as was one of Paulie's many favorite words, don't act cunty with me, don't be such a little cunt, etc., etc., in that sense. Cunts meaning annoying, bratty, assholes, without having to call them assholes. Cunt just kind of encompasses all that in one fucking very still harsh to use word. And I hope I will gladly defend cunt never getting canceled. Because, I listen, we lost a couple of words that we were very fond of using. I've used in the past as a youth that I'm not proud of, now knowing that it's hurt so many people or a specific community. But I have no shame in admitting I did. But ever since I knew it was wrong to do so and I knew it was directly hurting people, I stopped using those words. Cunt is one I'm not going to fucking stop ever. I'll die defending the honor of the word cunt. With that being said, the top five biggest cunts on the Sopranos, character-wise, of course, not in real life. We're not going to be here degrading people like that. Number five, one of the top five biggest cunts, has got to go to the Russian guma, or Tony's little Russian gal. Now, undeniably a piece of ass. I forget her name in real life, but she did a really good job of, well, of course, playing a Russian girl, because she was Russian. But piece of ass at a very heavy toll to pay in expense of her getting in her feelings, which is surprising for a Russian gal, let's be honest. I can speak from experience because I'm with a Russian right now, and my girlfriend is Russian, and eventually I'll marry her. Great girl and all that, smart. Uh, I can speak her praises all the time, but emotionally disattached, sorry, emotionally detached is the best way I can describe her at many times. As is Tony's girl, but then again, she gets so stuck in the feelings, I guess, because she realizes she's with a mob boss, a guy with power, an alpha male, etc., too, that because she can't have him all to herself, she gets flustered so easily into, at some points, 
calling the main house, speaking to Carmela, telling her about Tony having slept with her cousin and or sister with one leg. So Carmela, of course, rightfully so, Carmela gets heavily offended by Tony of all things, sleeping with one bitch with one leg. How am I no better than a bitch with one leg? And you're out there sticking your dick in whatever has a fucking pussy and a pulse. You scumbag, you fat pig, et cetera, et cetera, whatever. He did deserve that from her. But she's a snitch. She gives up deets easily. She likes to harass and fucking, you know, really annoy the fuck out of Carmella, Tony in general too. Very demandy, very needy and shit too, to the point where she attempts supposedly to kill herself because Tony won't be with her or he tries to cut her off completely. And she fails in doing so. And she even gets with fucking the assemblyman, whatever the fuck his name was in New Jersey, that was a, a close friend of Tony, just to get back at Tony by knowing, hey, I was yours, but now I'm his side piece, so take that shit, pretty much. So a big cunt in that sense. Big cunt energy is what she's got. But not the biggest of them all. She's only number five. Number four on the top five biggest cunts on the whole fucking Sopranos series slash show, whatever. Number four goes to Phil, the New York mob boss who takes over after Johnny Sachs, Sack or Sachs, passes away. Tony doesn't like him at all at any point. He only learns to try to tolerate him as best he can. Phil is very cunty in his behavior. He's very, you know... Stuck on the fact that he spent so long in jail, which makes sense. We can give him that much. But he's so stuck on having been in jail for so long and having seen all these other guys that he feels he's better than having advanced much further than he ever could or did only because he was in jail. He starts to act with his really bad temper the whole time. He's quick to fucking just go to violence, have someone killed instead of talking it out. And he's proves... At least in this time during the show, it was more of a problem, and you can use this terminology, but I'll apply it now because it makes more sense to do so. He was a huge homophobe in the sense of hating Vito so much for being gay, and when he came out, he wasn't dealt with or killed off immediately by Tony, his boss. He took that so personal, besides the fact that Tony's cousin, Tony B, shout out to Steve Buscemi, who played that role beautifully, and directed a couple episodes, actually, two of The Sopranos, Pine Barrens, one of my favorites, is not my favorite episode, directed by Steve Buscemi, so definitely check that out if you haven't. Also having to fucking deal with Phil, also having to deal with the fact that Tony's cousin killed his brother for no good reason besides trying to get some money in his pocket for killing somebody and doing a favor for somebody else. He has to deal with all that shit, so of course, he's unsettled, he's unnerved, he's, you know, beside himself having to fucking put up with all the shit that Tony dealt. I get it. But he's also so cunty, so vengeful, and again, clearly so homophobic against all people. Vito, I get it. Vito did fucking marry his cousin and ditched his children for the fact of, you know, going after some man ass. I get it too, but to really take it to that length and to that extent of having Vito beat to death in front of him while he sits comfortably on the mattress, and then presumably, as we're told later by Bobby, who retells the fact, oh, they beat him to death and they stuck a pull stick up his whole ass. And he's just there like not even breaking a sweat. We're taking pleasure by maybe not smiling, but at least taking pleasure knowing that, you know, the deed was done. Or according to him, justice was served. According to Vito being gay and all. He's just so cunty, so petty, so much of a pussy towards the end too where... They try to make amends, Tony and uh, Carmine Jr. He tells his guy to tell them he's not home, but then as soon as they start walking away from the house, he starts screaming from his bedroom window like a pussy, and stay the fuck out, you fat piece of shit, and talking through his fucking window like he's a like he's a five-year-old, you know, on a, being grounded and talking down to his friends. I can't come out and play ball. My cunty mom says I have to be a good boy and do my homework, that bitch, or whatever. That's Phil, though. I never liked him, and we'll talk about him a little... We'll talk about him more a little later on as well, too. That's number four. Number three in the top five biggest cunts on The Sopranos. Mm-mm. Hard to leave her at number three. 
I did not like her from Jump Street. I did not grow up to like her. I did not enjoy her. And we've discussed her already as being a very sloppy looking person. Literally, a.k.a. Tony Soprano with a wig and big tits. Da, 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 da. Number three is Janice on the top five biggest cunts of the Sopranos. Janice is lazy, manipulative, opportunistic, and you can't spell cunt without calling her a cunt, a C-U-N-T, cunt. Holy shit, she took after her mother, Livia, the, the, the queen of the cunts, took after her as much as she tries to play it off with the fucking Buddhist shit, the yoga shit, the trying to fucking better herself through Christ shit. Oh yeah, and right, she was uh, fucking with that other guy, the overly religious dude. The guy that was almost like 20 years older than her too, but with a full head of hair and a ponytail, even though it was all white. But still, such a fake cunt. Tries to cover up her own flaws and faults. Is she any worse than Tony? At least Tony doesn't try to hide who he is. You know, he could be manipulative as well. He could be very petty also. But at least he knows to try to play it off, laugh it off, by still owning up to who he is. She tries to pretend to be a whole nother person the whole time. I love, I forget the episode when, but when Tony pretty much triggers her after she's forced to go into anger management therapy for beating up another soccer mom in a soccer game, and he knows which buttons to push, how to trigger her ass, and how to set her off enough to be like, you know what, fuck this anger management therapy. I'm going to stab my brother to death just because he provoked me enough. He said mean things about me. And then, of course, the underlying cunt that's always been there rises, bubbles to the surface. Without a doubt, without a question. That's Janice. She's always been lazy. She's always had a price. She's always been demanding things. She's always felt like she's entitled to things on top of that, too. She always tries to act like she worries about others when really she just wants others' money. She wants her mom's money when she's fucking losing her mind slowly but surely and or dying. She just wants Uncle Junior's attention for the sake of maybe he'll just blab about where he hid his fucking money this whole time because he ends up broke and, uh, you know, crazy and or just losing all his memory. But she's only worried about his money where it's at. That's it. She's fucking lazy. Oh, yeah. And then she abandoned a kid or some shit, too. Whatever the fuck. Uh, what was his name? I forget the kid's name that she had in Seattle. But, uh, yeah. She pretty much left him to his own luck. What a mom, right? Oh, we're not done yet. Number two in the biggest cunts of The Sopranos. The top five biggest cunts on The Sopranos. Number two, that honor goes to AJ. It was hard to put AJ at number two because he really started to act out towards the end as nothing but a little fucking bitch of a cunt. Uh, needy, greedy, whiny, mopey, dopey, millennial energy fucking little cunt that he was. It's a 180 from how we got introduced to him as a dumb shy but just at least good kid as he was when he was younger in the first couple of seasons then oh man he took a fucking nosedive as soon as he got older and his fucking ball hair started to grow because he just showed his true colors as far as i'm entitled i'm the boy of the family of an italian family i'm gonna get what i want he's always known this but it isn't made clear to him because he's a fucking dummy until his sister meadow points it out to him like I have to prove myself by being a doctor, potentially, a lawyer, maybe, whatever, because I'm the girl. You're the boy. You can fuck up all the times you want, and they will love you, and they will put you on the pedestal as number one, as proven already, too. The kid sucks when he's grown up. He can't even kill himself. He's that much of a fucking loser when he tries to drown himself in the pool, bag over his head, uh, send a block tied to his fucking feet, as soon as he starts... As soon as he starts seeing what the fuck he's doing to himself, he starts to panic. And he starts to fucking try to free himself from him trying to kill himself. Like, I'm not making fun of mental health or behavioral health, whatever. I'm just saying he was that big of a loser, he couldn't even do that right. As so many fucking things he can't do right. Even towards the end, when finally, he's actually got a good idea for once, for his own, of joining the army, getting trained, becoming a personal pilot and shit too. He can't even carry on with that because 
as soon as they proposed to him, he could be, um, you know, like basically an intern for fucking Carmine Jr.'s uh, movie production company too. He jumps at that chance, thinking of course of uh, owning his light club like he wanted to at some point, getting to know people in power and higher positions too as well for his own benefit and his own back pocket growing. He's a little cunt. He's very, on top of all that, lazy too. And Jesus Christ, he couldn't let that uh, fine piece of ass uh, Blanca go or get her out off his mind. But still, he was obsessed with her and just mopey, dopey, depressed about her too, leaving. He gets, an, he gets lucky enough to get another piece of ass girlfriend right after her, which is a fucking model, a model on top of that for him. But... Finally, when she's gonna com he's gonna convince her to finally fuck her in the car, he parks over a bunch of fucking leaves while they're smoking, probably flicked the cigarette on that pile of leaves and burned the car up in the flames and tried to play it off like, oh, I'm an environmentalist. Uh, SUVs are gas uh, guzzlers anyway, so thank God, good riddance. Uh, YOLO, whatever. God, he would have been like, Drake would have been a perfect fucking AJ Soprano on the show. That's all I'm saying with that. Surprisingly, not the number one cunt, but the number one cunt on the top five biggest cunts of the Sopranos. Right now, I'll be straightforward. Holy shit, no one was going to beat Livia Soprano out of this honor. Number one biggest cunt. Oh, Jesus Christ. What a miserable, old, nasty, bitter, fucking cunt that was Livia Soprano. Enough said with it being said that she agreed and she had the fucking nerve, the loose, cunty pussy lips to say, why not have my son killed? He's no good as a boss. He's not a good son. He's never been a good boy or whatever. Tony can't even recall one fucking day in her life growing up under her fucking manipulative ass control that she's ever been happy and only once his dad is dead johnny boy is when she remembers him finally all of a sudden saying oh my johnny he treated me so good i miss him every day of my life with the fucking crocodile tears going on that fucking old nasty cunt god damn it it made me so upset having to deal with her from seasons one two and three and thank god she died in three well okay let me take that back Rest in peace to the actress that played Livia Soprano, because that's what happened. She died in real life, so obviously the character could not continue. To the point where, in the episode where she died, they had to CGI her face. Now, this is like 2001, 2002 to doing this. They had to CGI her face onto someone else's, another older lady's body, who, <laughs> the funniest part of it is, the lady they CGI'd her face onto had like, a visibly worse much older body because like the arm started flapping at some point and it wouldn't stop at all it was like a fucking earthquake going on only in her fucking tricep that shit kept going and going <laughs> and also the cgi was so bad it was like what they tried to do with the irishman which at some points it was okay but at a certain angle you could tell what the fuck did they do here what kind of debauchery whatever it was always the same facial expression like just getting scrunched up and all upset and petty like she was throughout the whole fucking length that she was on the show for but it was a really bad job you can clearly tell something's wrong with her face or better yet said once you read that shit it's like oh wait that's not her face that's why it looks so weird <laughs> that was funny though when they fucking had to do that I they felt the need to do that and I guess budget wouldn't permit it to last any longer because it was only like what was it two three minutes at most but then that's it, she was gone afterwards, oh, grandma died, whatever, and of course, uh, no one showed up to her fucking funeral besides immediate friends and family that were forced and dragged into the Soprano home to remember Janice being the fucking self-centered cunt that needs to fucking always be like, oh, I'm the fucking angel, I'm the personal Jesus you all know, let's all remember my mother fondly, because she was great after all, she gave birth to me, hey, and no one can say one good thing about her until it's Carmelo who has enough balls to say, no one liked this woman, she was a cunt. Let's just fucking eat our food and forget about it and move on. Janice, you big fat cunt. But yeah, Livia Soprano, without a doubt, listen, to have, and, you know, have the gall to have 
the uncle of your own son, agree to have him killed? Cunt. That's it. And you died a cunt, too. That's the number one biggest cunt on The Sopranos. Livia Soprano. Mama Soprano. Fuck that cunt. Now we move on to the next top five. And the one to end things for today. This episode, at least. The top fives. According to who that's been watching. In regards to The Sopranos. The best thing to happen to television ever. On who that's been watching today. Hosted by me, who this, of course. The last top five for today. Concerning The Sopranos. Is going to be the top five most goddamn rough deaths of the whole series now there's no shortage of deaths violence brains getting blown out guts exposed blood flowing on the fucking series which makes it so great because it's not like it's holding back in comparison to movies where they got the budget the CGI special effects to do that shit no you're getting movie level fucking quality acting drama action all this shit too on a weekly basis you know 12 episodes a season who can fucking complain every episode was fucking great in itself but the top five deaths or at least the top five deaths that made me say god damn of a sorts as follows number five Gigi <clears throat> he was the guy that was placed in charge of I forget which family when Tony wouldn't assign or agree that Ralphie should be made a capo because he's a very high earner and well, the guy they all like because, well, he's a fucking jerk, but he's funny and he makes a lot of money for them too. So, of course, why not make him a captain? Tony won't agree to it, so instead he makes Gigi the captain. Ralphie, in spite of that being so petty and such a cunt about it, makes his, his life impossible. Plus, the poor guy Gigi has enough stress, as a lot of them do because they all got grown children, of thinking, how am I going to afford college for... Two kids, three kids, because Italians, you know, they like to have as many as they can. God bless them. But, you know, at some point, you got to think of the bigger pictures, too. College, first cars, movie expenses, et cetera, et cetera, too. College is a big worry and a big headache. Rightfully so for Gigi because he gets so worked up about Ralph being up his ass, literally and proverbially. Well, Ralph's already busy with stuff in his own ass because he's freaky like that, but still. Ralph's up his ass, and also he's got the overlooming fucking worry of college above him with his children concerned. He goes to take a shit because he's stressed out and pushes so hard, apparently, that he has a heart attack and dies on the toilet. I saw that. I said, God damn. Fuck. It really didn't have to happen to him, even though he was a lesser character, but still, it just sucks that stress can do that to you. Even pushing too hard, if you're fucking just stressed out, you're, you're strung out, whatever, too. And just do you in like that. That's how Elvis died, allegedly. Pushing too hard in the toilet because he was on so many laxatives that his own guts didn't work. Or his digestive tract didn't work enough to have him push his own shit out on his own strength. Well, you know, that stuff happens. But R.I.P. G.G. Goddamn, though. Number four on the most goddamn worthy deaths on The Sopranos itself. Goes to pussy. Oh, man. Listen. This one made me say, God damn. Because you knew it was coming. Without a doubt, you were going to witness it. But I grew to love pussy. You know, as a horny fucking young teenage boy, of course I grew to love pussy in general. But I'm talking about pussy, the character on the show. Uh, I forget his name in real life, Vincent Pastor, I want to say. But shout out to him. He did pussy very well. You grew to love pussy. I loved pussy... Probably one of my favorite characters, just because he was very loyal to Tony. He was very loyal to the whole family. He did his own thing. He wasn't a loud mouth. He wasn't like um, all about having bravado or being flashy, pizzazzy, nothing. Seemingly loved his wife, really loved his kid who was going to be an athlete in college and all that shit too. Had to worry about putting his kid through college, through a good-ass college. So he started selling on the side, making what he could. He got into trouble. He got pinched. And of course, the Fed said to him, listen, we'll let you go off easy. We'll let you potentially leave a life under the witness protection program if you cooperate and get us the deets on Tony's inner workings and everybody else involved too. So he's immediately stuck with the fact that he's got to deal with all that shit. How am I going to fucking snitch on somebody I know in my whole fucking life practically versus how am I not going to, how am I not going to comply with the Fed's? As far as them wanting information, and if I don't comply, 
I go to jail. Then everything I've worked for goes to shit as far as my kid going to college, my wife and her health, our household, etc., etc. Pussy really grew on me in that sense. So when they killed him, I fucking felt it. I even cried a little bit because, again, I grew to love pussy so much. And also the scene that really got to me as far as pussy's concerned is when he's at uh, AJ's, what was it, first communion or some shit like that. I forget what the thing is because I'm not religious like that, but the thing where they fucking um, anoint the boy growing into a man, the Catholics, whatever, too, and they catch him smoking weed. They don't know how to fucking deal with or talk to AJ, already becoming difficult early signs of. So it's up to Uncle Pussy who overhears that there's some issues going on. Meanwhile, he's wearing a wire because the feds told him to do so or else, but he has enough fucking balls that like, you know what, fuck this wire. I need to talk to fucking this kid I've known since he was a baby, AJ. Sit him down, remind him his family loves him, be a good boy, behave, do better in school. If you need someone to talk to, I'm here for you. And then he goes to break down and cry in the bathroom because, you know, he's divided. Do I wear the wire? Do I give the deeds to the feds? Or do I say, fuck this, run the risk, go to jail anyway for the sake of not being a rat to Tony and them? So it really fucking tore me apart when they fucking killed him on the ship and, you know, cement shoes over the fucking ship and all that too, laid the rest like a fucking fish. Yeah, so I mean, that, that one had me like a little in my feelings too much. Pussy. Number four. Uh, shout outs to 810 Bad News Vaughn for joining the live. Number three in the top five most goddamn deaths on The Sopranos. Would have to go to Bobby. Bobby Bacala. Listen. Lost a lot of weight, looked a lot better after he lost that fucking violently possessed by a demon alien about to pop out his fucking gut. What was uh, disturbing enough to deal with. But Bobby grew on you. At first he was kind of dopey, stupid, you know, a, a, a lackey, playing second hand to Uncle Junior and all that too. But then he became a man. He let his balls drop. Started becoming a good earner for Tony and all of them too as well. So you grew to respect Bobby. He finally fucking, um, what do you call it? Became his own man. Loses the weight. You grow to love him. But of all things, he has an obsession or a pastime as I like to call it with these toy trains. Which shout out to that community too. All the toy train collectors, whatever too. Not a cheap habit. I looked into it myself out of curiosity and I seen that Depending on the models, how vintage they are, how old they are, whatever, too. They can vary in price and they can be damn near like buying mint conditions, out of print, baseball trading cards, whatever the fuck. So not a cheap hobby. So he's starting to earn a lot. I guess he's getting ballsy and flashy enough to be like, you know what? I'm going to invest in toy trains and spend hours upon hours throughout my day watching the train loop around in my fucking garage instead of parking a car in there. Or doing something constructive with that space afforded to you as a homeowner. But okay, ignore your kids, ignore your fat wife that looks too much like her brother. I get that. But then you got these cute kids of yours you made with your cool wife, the favorite wife. But you're still ignoring them all together playing with trains and shit. When he gets shot up in the toy train shop, <laughs> I felt like of some sorts there was some body shaming going there too. Because... He did lose a lot of weight, on the show at least, of Corn Devon. He was wearing a fat suit the whole time. But who knows? When he got shot up, though, I think they kept shooting at him and filled him full of lead, literally, for like a minute straight, as many times as they shot him. I think because, you know, they're the fucking low-level guys, the ones that you can barely trust with like an ounce of weed or anything like that, too, let alone a gun. So they're the ones hired to be like the expendables, the men on the front line that, oh, if he gets killed on the job, who, who fucking cares? We'll get his cousin to come in and do his dirty work for him. They kept shooting at Bobby for like a minute straight, maybe like 25, 30 times. I think in the back of their minds, they were thinking, you know what? Let's shoot some extra bullets in him because he's so fat. We got to make sure he dies because, you know, the fat might stop the bullets halfway, you know, hitting vital organs and or the brain or heart. Thick arteries might clog the fucking bullets and stop him from actually dying, so we just gotta make sure. Hey, boss, they did good. Look, I shot him like 57 times. There's no way he fucking lived past that. 
and they're shooting the fucking toy trains. They're almost hitting fucking kids. They hit the floor. They were smart enough to hit the floor as soon as the fucking bullets started ringing. The shop owner behind the counter probably counting the fucking time on his watch. Like, all right, it's been 17 minutes of nonstop shooting. I want to go home and close up at least, too. They didn't take no money. They didn't take not even the toy train thinking it might be worth something one day to trade in or off to the pawn shop or nothing. They just shot him dead for 13 minutes straight and dropped the guns and left and went about their fucking days to tell the boss, the deed is done, Bobby's dead. That one was like, God damn. They really had to take that long to fucking shoot him dead, but whatever. Mob mentality, I guess. That's what it is. Number two on the top five most goddamn worthy deaths on The Sopranos. That's got to go to Vito. As we discussed earlier, lost a lot of weight just like Bobby. Still look kind of sloppy after the fact. But that's neither here nor there. But then it, it is here or there in the case of him being gay and looking for uh, man ass, whatever, too, having fun in that sense, which is fine. No problems there. You grew to love him because I love how the show actually tastefully approached his whole dilemma. Him being gay, him leaving his wife and kids behind for the sake of, I'm gay, I can't take it anymore. Well, not dick, but as far as having to hide the fact that he loves dick, I can't take it anymore. I gotta run off and, you know, get hitched on some dick, some cock. Get some lively cock in my life. Goes up to fucking where'd he go to? Rhode Island or Massachusetts, whatever. Hooks up with Johnny Cakes. They have their little fucking affair for however, however long that was too. They enjoy it themselves. And, but they're able to do it tastefully. He's not so conflicted. It's not like po anyone's pointing fingers at him. It's not like he wants to kill himself because he's gay or I let people down. I'm, I'm ashamed. Uh, I'm a disgrace to the mob and shit too. No, he's about his business. He goes about his fucking life. I mean, despite the fact he left behind the whole family pretending to be straight. Still, I, I liked how they approached it. It was like, you know, acknowledging it's there, but also not shaming it by having like some crazy ass behavior. However, it's goddamn worthy just because, you know what? When he gets killed and or beat to death, better yet said by... Uh, Phil and his guys and Phil's just sitting there on the edge of a mattress watching him get beat to death They have to top it off with as Bobby capped it later on when he fucking You know brought the news to everybody else Tony and them saying and they stuck a pool cue up his ass It's like oh shit, man. They really had to do all that. So that's like ah, god damn You don't really see him. I like how they do that with the endearing Characters you grow to love like they don't show them actually getting killed just like they did with Adriana They didn't show her getting shot to death. They didn't show Vito getting beat to death either You just see the first blow coming in but not connecting But then to hear as they tell that you know pull stick up his ass to show You know you were hiding the gay guy the whole time. You didn't take action. So I took it for you Kind of like icing on the cake, but then I'm sure that icing wasn't too much of a Enjoyable flavor, Betty had said. That's Vito. And now number one death that's worthy of a goddamn of sorts, as far as The Sopranos is concerned, is Phil Latardo. Yeah, Phil Latardo. Yeah. So he becomes the boss in New York. He openly and will not deny the fact that he hates Tony. He keeps calling him a fat fuck, a pork chop, a veal chop, whatever too. Prime rib, truck roast, all that shit too, I guess, because obviously Tony loves his meats. He must be a big fan of Arby's because we got the meats. So does Tony. Look at his fucking gut. Phil can't stand him, and the way Phil gets done, it's hilarious too, because initially they fucking kill a guy uh, that looks a lot like Phil, to their credit, the fucking imported hitman they got from the motherland, Italy, to do the job. They kill the Ukrainian guy that looks a lot like Phil in his own home with his fucking piece of ass daughter up the stairs in her bathrobe. Then they finally come around actually killing Phil because Phil had already put the order out to kill Tony. He gets shot in the head at the gas station while he's stepping out to go make a phone call. His wife's at the wheel with, I guess, his grandchildren in the back seat. He gets shot in the head once. Get shot, I guess, in the chest, if I remember correctly, another time. So he's dead, dead, to make sure. Kill the head, then the heart. On top of that, in the moment of panic and despair, um, the wife 
I can understand why this happens. I'm not saying it's a gender thing. I'm not going to blame it on females. But I can understand someone panicking, of all things a woman would, like she did. She leaves the car, leaves the keys in the car, locks the car door behind her, leaves the car in drive. The car starts to move itself with the babies in the back as she's panicking, despairing, trying to get the car open again to save the babies. But she's not thinking about, oh shit, Phil's still there. Well, he's dead, but of course, whatever. The car starts rolling slowly. And oddly, conveniently, Tony Soprano's dumb luck enough. The car starts going slowly, slowly, surely, but slowly towards Phil's head. And with all the pressure available, the car goes over his head. The front wheel and the back wheel. And you can hear the crunch of the skull underneath the tires. As the babies have no idea what's going on besides they're in for a bumpy ride. Literally at the expense of Phil's fucking skull. R.I.P. to film. It's at the very last episode, the series finale, we get that fucking pleasant treat of Phil's death, a very satisfying death, where it's like, God damn, okay. Every death up until that point, even the hilarious one that still makes me laugh to this day, I forget his name on the show, let alone real life, but shout out to him, the kid from Bronx Tale. When he gets shot up, when he's tied up in the chair in a little warehouse or shit, whatever, with Tony and, um, I think it was Bobby and Syl, whatever. When he gets shot up to death, Tony offers him a little Diet Pepsi before he, he's going to get shot to death. And <laughs> whatever, and he's crying for his mommy, and he's fucking all ready to jump out of his chair as he's still tied down to it. That was probably my favorite death up until Phil gets knocked. And boy, Phil goes out in fucking glory. It's wonderful. It's, it, that's my favorite death. And, but also my most goddamn worthy death on The Sopranos itself. That's enough top fives for today. All we did was top fives for the Sopranos today on who has been watching live. Yes, we're at the very end. Of course, you might be wondering. You might be asking. Of course, you're fucking watching. So, of course, you are. What did I think about the end of the series? I'm still going to say, despite the ending, that the Sopranos is the greatest thing to happen to television ever. That's the blanket statement I'm going to fucking die in a hill with if I have to. Believe me, I still have to watch a lot of other shows. Breaking Bad, Dexter. Uh, still got to finish Game of Thrones properly, even though I saw the last season. That was the first thing I watched, and it wasn't that good. The Wire, a bunch of other shit, too, to really kind of justify that statement. But I'll still stand by this. The Sopranos is the greatest thing to happen to television ever. With that being said, the ending. A lot of people are fucking bipolar. They hate it. They love it. There's some that don't understand it. How could they do that to us? At the six seasons, on top, beautifully put together, directed, produced, all that shit, etc., etc. How could they leave us hanging with that fucking cliffhanger of an ending? Now, you want to get my fucking take on it? How do I feel about it? I think that just seals the deal on the genius of the writing, production, everything that went into making this show possible. As far as the ending we got, there is no ending. We're not clear on the fucking ending. There's a lot of fan theories, setups, callbacks, little Easter eggs, tidbits, clues, angles that might fucking lead to something concrete or conclusive. No. The genius of the show is. I think what they wanted to avoid was a definitive ending as far as something to close the books on it for good. It's kind of like a book you get up to, you don't want it to fucking end, you put that little like dog ear flap on it to come back to eventually or you finish the book but you got a little fucking page mark where you keep going back to to start over again. Maybe not the whole book from start to finish but like start from this point to finish it over again. It's one of those shows where I think it was so beautifully done, put together, massively crafted. There was never going to be an ending anybody was ever going to be happy with. No matter how good the last episode was, which it was up until the last point. No matter how bad it could have possibly been, which even with six seasons and like almost 90 episodes. My opinion, of course, here is what I'm speaking, but the show was never bad, never slow, and never hit low points. How do you even address that episode? The very ending of it. How do you even talk about it? How do you make people happy? 
there's just some things that are best left unsaid, which alludes more to his genius knowing that, you know what? Let's give fans, let's give viewers, let's give whoever watches this shit the open platform to imagine the ending they want for Tony. Has he been a great guy up until this point? No. Has he been extremely lucky? Absolutely. Was he necessarily strictly a bad guy? Yeah, justifiably in his actions, depending on which way you want to look at that. Maybe. But how about this? The ending. What do I think happened? 